The Greeks had the maxim, know thyself. How do we come to know ourselves in terms of our personalities and more importantly, potential? One of the first ways to come to know yourself is to understand that you don't. You know, you can learn to kind of watch yourself like you're watching a stranger, but you have to adopt a position. It's a position of radical humility, I would say. Humility in two senses. So one sense would be the humility of recognizing your ignorance. So you have to understand that you don't know who you are. And that's not easy to understand because you think you know. But then, you know, you remember you can't control yourself very well. You're not very disciplined. You're full of flaws. Maybe you don't know yourself as well as you think. But it's hard to get low enough to understand how deeply it is the case that you are ignorant about who you are. Now, there's an upside to that, too, which also is that you're also ignorant about who you could be. And so the discovery of that, you know, is some reward for the horror of determining who you actually are. And then I would say, well, then you watch yourself. You watch yourself like you're watching a stranger. You watch what you say and you listen. And you think, well, what, what sort of person would say that? And how am I reacting emotionally when I'm communicating in that manner? You know, is that making me feel stronger, weaker? Is it, is, it, is it filling me with shame? Is it helping my confidence? Am I laying out a lie? Am I deceiving myself and other people? Am I adopting this personality at parties that is designed to impress and to amuse and it comes across as nothing but like self-centered narcissism? What are my dark fantasies? What are my aggressive fantasies? What is it that I'm willing to do? What am I interested in so that I'll spontaneously pursue it? What do I procrastinate about and why? What am I unwilling to do? What do I think is good? What do I congratulate myself for accomplishing? And what do I berate myself for failing to confront and to implement? Those are all incredibly complicated questions and you don't know the answers to them. So that's, that's a start. And then in terms of potential, well, You'll discover a little bit more about your potential as you discover who you are, especially the darker parts of yourself, because then you discover your potential for mayhem. There's some real utility in that. The discovery that you're dangerous, it's such a useful discovery. It's actually something that strengthens you because the first thing that a realization like that can in fact produce is the ambition to incorporate that danger into a higher order personality, that dangerousness into a higher order personality. And that can make you implacable. That can make you someone who can say no when you need to say no. You know, that can make you someone who won't avoid necessary conflict. And so that's as unbelievably useful. And so that's one of the potentials that you might discover. The other thing you do to discover your potential is to, well, you challenge yourself. Rule four in my book, 12 Rules for Life, is compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to some, who someone else is today. And that's kind of a good way to start this. It's like, take a bit of a look at yourself and think about what's not so good that you could improve, that you should improve by your own standards and that you would improve, you know, and set yourself a little goal. You know, maybe you're not studying at all at, at, and you're at university. Or maybe you're, maybe you're at work and you've got this stack of paper there, you know, and you haven't looked at that damn stack for like a month and you know that you should be and you're bo bothering yourself at night because you're avoiding that. It's like maybe think, well, I've avoided that stack of paper completely for one month. I'm quite a coward when it comes to whatever snakes might be hidden in that stack of paper. How about tomorrow I just like put that stack of paper in front of me on my desk and I like... I glance through it for 15 seconds. See if I can do that. It's like, well, you set yourself a goal of improvement. You know, it's a humble goal because really, are you such a coward that the best that you can bloody well manage after a month of avoidance is 15 seconds of exposure to a stack of paper? You know, it could easily be. You've been avoiding it. So you're obviously afraid of it. And so the situation could be that dismal and dire and you might think, well, geez, it's no bomb to my ego. It's no, it's, it's no, it's not fostering the, the strength of my ego to 
recognizing myself, someone who could only withstand 15 seconds of exposure to that thing I'm afraid of. And so that's a form of humility too. It's like, there's things you could do to improve and you know what they are. And there's small steps that you could take that you might take that would put you in that direction. And then the question is, are you big enough to take those small steps? You know, are you capable of grappling with the fact that you're fundamentally flawed to the point where you have to break things down into almost childlike steps in order to manage them? And the answer to that is, yeah, you are. Most people have things they avoid, you know, and they're afraid of. So I would say to some degree, it's the lot of everyone. People vary in the degree to which they've conquered that. And you do meet people from time to time who are extraordinarily disciplined. But most of the time, they've got disciplined in exactly this manner. It's through slow, incremental improvement. And then you challenge yourself. It's like, well, could I do this? That would be better. Then you find out. And then you think, well, is there something slightly larger and more challenging that I could do? That would be better. And, and you try it and you find out. And as you try it and you find out, Generally, you get better at it and you can take on larger and larger challenges. That's why I suggested, you know, you take responsibility for yourself. That's part of standing up straight with your shoulders back. It's like, take on the world, man. Only at the level that you can manage. You know, when you're ignorant and biased and deeply flawed and immature, it's where everyone starts. You don't want to bite off more than you can chew, but it doesn't mean that you can't wrestle with with part of reality, you know, some part that's small enough so that you have a good shot at victory. And then you attain victory over some small part of the chaos. And then you're the person who's victorious over chaos. You're just a beginner, but that's who you are. And then maybe you can get unbelievably good at that. And maybe you can ally to that the ability to recast tyrannical order into chaos and restructured into something deeper, more profound and more suitable for human habitation. That's the other half of the hero myth, right? Half is to overcome chaos itself. And half is to confront tyranny where it needs to be confronted. You do that by challenging yourself humbly at the level that you're able to function. It's easier to understand if you think about a child that you're trying to rear properly and you want to make that child, help that child reveal their highest potential, whatever that is, whatever that means. And what you do is you don't set them a series of impossible tasks in the hope of undermining their self-confidence. You form a relationship with them that is predicated on your interest in their highest mode of being. And then you offer them challenges that are precisely optimized to their ability right? So they can do them, but they have to stretch. The two elements of their ability would be what they can do and what, and how much they're capable of transforming what they can do. And an optimal challenge is stretches you to the end of what you can do and then into the domain of, of how you can transform. And so if you love a child, then you set them tasks of that nature. And maybe they have a reasonable chance of success, a 70% chance of success or an 80% chance of success might depend on how sensitive your child is. You do the same thing for yourself, but you have to be humble and wise enough to understand that you might have to aim pretty damn low, especially in those places where you're not functioning well. And it might be so embarrassing that you can't even that you can't bring yourself to fathom that that's actually who you are. You have to admit that. And there's going to be a loss of ego or destruction of ego, arrogant ego that necessarily accompanies that. But you need the loss of that arrogant ego because it's precisely what's interfering with your movement forward. You know, it's part of the adversarial process, mythologically speaking, that stops moral progress. You're too proud of who you think you are to notice what you're like so that you could change properly. You don't want to sacrifice that part of yourself. It's probably associated with some delusion that helps you maintain a positive, although very fragile self-image, you know, in the absence of genuine effort. You know yourself by watching and paying attention. A snake watches like cold-bloodedly with no emotional reaction just to see what's there. It doesn't allow 
symbolically speaking, doesn't allow what is wanted or desired to interfere with what is observed. So you watch yourself like that. Well, that's the beginning. And then you challenge yourself continually to see how far past yesterday you can push today and tomorrow. And to continually experiment with expanding the domains not only of your competence, but of your ability to increase that competence. And it's not obvious to me. The, the upper limit to that is proportional to the moral effort that you put into it. The more that's guided by the highest of all possible visions, right? The alliance with the highest of all possible conceivable good. And the more it's motivated by, the more it's accompanied by truth in speech and action, the more you will develop your potential. And I believe that potential to be as un unlimited in the upward direction, more unlimited in the upward direction than it is unlimited in the direction that brings people to, to the political and social hells that so often characterize the world that we inhabit. And so you also, I suppose, have to be willing to undertake that as an adventure because it's a hell of a thing to bear that kind of responsibility. You know, it, it, takes, it takes a person out of the ordinary it takes them out of themselves. There's an alienation and an isolation that goes along with that and a, and a great sorrow, all of that together. But there's deep meaning to be had in it and, it's, and there isn't anything better that you can do.